Pri Janmashti we once again, uh, as we begin the satsang with Naya Swami Jayaji's discourse, I would like to especially uh, welcome our uh, some new audiences which are with us online from Ahmedabad, from Nasik and Aurangabad. So welcome to all our friends and students over there. And of course, welcome to all of you who have come in person. So I'll invite Jayaji to come and give a discourse now to us. Thank you, Diji. And John Mastami, blessings to all of you. It's a blessing for me to be able to share with you today. And I'm glad to see we have so many people here today. We almost are uh, outgrowing our center here. We're having to start thinking what we're going to do next. I'm going to speak for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then Aditya Ji will also speak 10 or 15 minutes. And then we'll have a RT and a blessing ceremony. I want to begin with uh, the reading, all very familiar, from chapter 4. Krishna, the blessed Lord said, Many have been my births, and many also yours. I remember all of mine, though you remember yours not. Though I am the Lord of all creation, and in my true self, and abiding ever in my cosmic nature, forever unborn, yet I, by my yoga maya, assume an outward form. O oh, Bharata, whenever virtue declines and vice, a dharma, is in the ascendant, I incarnate myself on earth as an avatar appearing from age to age in visible form. I come to destroy evil and to reestablish virtue. So very, very familiar, those words quoted many times. And we know that Krishna is an avatar and he came. And he came for a larger reason for society, for this world at large. But also, I think we have to remember that he came for each one of us individually each one of us. This morning, I came early here to the center this morning to uh, meditate. And because it was Janmashtami, I naturally, my heart wanted to focus upon Krishna this morning. And so I came and I was in my meditation trying to give my devotion to Krishna to try to feel those special blessings, just as I do on the other masters' birthdays. I try to feel their particular blessings. So it was this morning for Krishna, trying to f feel what is that? What is that power? And of course, each of us draw something special from each of the masters. For But for me, I felt a very uh, compassionate benevolence coming to me this morning as I was meditating upon Krishna and the um, Murti here. I was thinking of he was blowing that flute especially for me, calling me home back to him. And as I was as I was meditating upon that and trying to feel those blessings this morning, a curious question passed through my mind. I want you to think about this question too. And it was a question that I was meditating on this, trying to feel the answer to it. And the question was, we know that the avatars come again and again. And Krishna says in this reading that he had come many times. This was not his first time. Many times he's come. And, we, and we're told this, of course, with our masters here as well. Master said he'd come a trillion times as long as one stray brother was left weeping by the wayside. So they come and again and again to redeem souls, to bring them back to God. And I, But I was thinking, my question was, what if they did not come? What if there was no what if there was no avatars? What if it, we were cast out into this world and we were on our own to find our way back? Is that possible? Is the avatar necessary to have? And I'd never thought of that question before. I've always ex just accepted it. And, but then I began to think, well, maybe it's not. Maybe we don't need the avatar. After all, when you're speaking of time, here we are. We find ourselves embodied, making our way back to God. So it takes, you know, another day and night of Brahma or two or three or ten. What difference would it make? We're here. Time is infinite. We have all the time in the world. And so we do we need that. 
And I began to think about that. And I remembered a story. And the answer, of course, is yes, the avatar comes. And there is a purpose. We do need that. Because what the avatar is, is avatar represents pure grace. There's no compulsion. I mean, avatar is not compelled, you might say, by anything. No compulsion. It's pure grace. And I remembered a story from the Mahabharata. And you know, after the battle was over, uh, Duryodhana hides in that water, underwater, and uh, everybody's looking for him. And of course, finally they find him and they draw him out of the water to fight that last battle he has uh, with Bhima. And Bhima, of course, uh, conquers Duryodhana, of course, but by a little bit of an unfair play, but he conquers him nevertheless. And then on, as Duryodhana is dying, he rails against Krishna, against the Pandavas, telling them if it had not been for their unfair means, and there was a number of incidents, as you know, if it had not been for that, they would have won, for sure. They would have won. And he's very passionate about this. And the Pandavas, of course, listening to him, you, they sort of were downcast because they had some agreement with them. They said, yes, they would, perhaps it hadn't been totally fair. And Krishna had, had impelled them to follow his instructions to win that battle. And so they were wavering with him. And Krishna would have none of it. He would have none of it. He told them, very sternly told them. He says, listen to me. If I had not been guiding your army, you would never have won. They would have won, except for me. Because of me, you were able to win that battle. And what he was saying was that this world, and of course this battle that we're talking about here is, yes, an outward battle. That's true, that all of that's true. But we're talking about this inward battle. We're talking about, had it not been for Krishna, who of course, you know, is the higher self, it's, it's a God, you could say, in within us, had it not been for Krishna, the other side would have won. Had it not been for God's grace, because in no matter how noble, no matter how great of a warrior, now no matter how strong our will, the battlefield is tilted, you see, in the direction of Maya. And without God's grace, we remain in that world of Maya. And it's the, it's, it's the hand of God reaching down to each one of us through God's grace, whether it's the Guru, who is God? God, God manifests as the Guru. Krishna, in this case, was the Guru. It's God, God's grace in some fashion, but even perhaps even in a larger sense, because what's also the message here, and which is what I found particularly consoling, is that what Krishna is also saying, and this principle of the avatar is saying, is that God reaches down not only for us individually in our inner soul, which is perhaps the major message, but even in this world itself, God is working in this world. We sometimes feel very alone that this world is chaos, that, uh, that uh, things go wrong, that somehow evil seems to prevail uh, in outwardly even. But there's a guiding hand in each one of our lives. Sometimes when we feel very alone, we feel that uh, nobody is on our side. Remember, somebody is on our side. God's on our side. And that God's grace works within each one of us. You could say it's, I don't want to put it uh, too plainly, but God created us. He threw us out here. We didn't ask for this. <laughs> I don't remember at least making this bargain. Somehow the, so these souls are, are thrown out into the world and it's God's job to redeem us. Lord, mother, it's your fault. 
I'm here. I didn't ask to be created. Now, maybe it's my fault I'm still here, but I didn't ask to get here in the first place, or at least I don't think so. But whatever. I, I don't know the answer to that. But, in that. but yet, we're cast out as souls into this world. And God's responsibility for that. But it's also, he takes the responsibility for also calling us back. But we have a part to play in that part of the drama. He calls us back, but we have to answer the call. Swamiji wrote a nice line in one of his festival service ceremonies. He said, God chooses those who choose him. You see, it's not he's not, he doesn't pick some and not the others. He picks everybody. But they have to choose that, you see. And so I think perhaps the avatar comes because he's compassionate. And that's what I was feeling this morning, that benevolent compassion, benevolence, that he wants to help. Sometimes that's good to remember that God is there wanting to help us. But we have to ask. We have to open ourselves and ask God, come, help me. Lift me up. I open myself to thee and come into my life and take me back to where my true home is. That's our part of the bargain. And in a sense, this is God's, you might say, you can't say an avatar is bound by anything, but if he has a duty, you could say he's waiting for that. Not that he has a duty for it, but he's waiting for that call. He's waiting. It's just like Krishna's playing that flute for all of us who can hear it, and each of us individually calling us back home. And I'd like to conclude by just reading. Again, hear now my supreme word, the most secret of all, because you are dearly beloved by me. I offer it now for your highest benefit. Absorb yourself in me, be wholly devoted to me, worship and bow to me alone. So shall you undoubtedly reach me. This I promise you faithfully, for you are dear to me. Forsaking all other dharmas, remember me alone. I will free you from all sin. Do not grieve. And that's a divine promise. Reach up to God and God will reach down to us. He is our redeemer if we ask him to help us. Many blessings. Thank you, Jayaji. I want to share also a little bit, not from the book, but about the book itself. All of you probably are familiar with this beautiful book, um, The Essence of the Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> Actually, maybe our online audiences are not so familiar, so maybe that was the reason to share. Uh, I want to share a little bit on the same theme that Jayaji said, that, you know, compassion is very natural, you know, when we start comprehending the nature of an avatar. And this morning, I was, I was also thinking about, you know, Krishna. I thought maybe let's speak about his love for us. But uh, it's subtle over here. Master said love. Uh, he compared love and bliss. He spoke of many, you know, uh, qualities, aspects of God. And Master finally said, he says, bliss is uh, the highest. He says, uh, there is no duality to it, likewise for divine love. But Master said, uh, fall in love with bliss itself, you know. Uh, be in love with bliss, with joy. And he says, but because if we focus on love, he says, there is a chance over there of it getting personal. Though he also approved of personal love, especially for God, for the avatars, for himself, you know. There's that story where Kriyanandaji, when he was a young monk, and uh, for those of you who've read about Swamiji's life, Kriyanandaji was intellectual. And uh, he read autobiography for Yogi and came to the ashram, and one day he saw Yogarandaji standing on the porch and giving some very mundane instructions about, you know, filling potholes or general instructions how to conduct a class to a minister who was about to take off in a car. And Swamiji was thinking, 
Here is this man who in childhood had cosmic consciousness, repeatedly entered Samadhi at his Guru's grace and is talking of these things. So he is standing over here in the body, but he is also everywhere. And maybe he knows what I'm thinking right now, which was quite true. And Master turned in his direction, not much later, and walked up to him. And Master was holding an apple and very lovingly, Swami says, he gave me that apple. And just looked at him and he said he walked back. And Swamiji then thought about it. And he says, the message I got from that incident was, Yogarandaji was saying, approach my infinity, love me, my conscious, infinite consciousness, not because of my nature, not despite my nature, but through it. That don't just think of me as somebody who has infinite consciousness and hence need not be spoken to, uh, you know, uh, interacted with and uh, so on. And he was saying that this is the way you will also grow. There was a lesson for the devotee. Otherwise, maybe Krinandaji could have become more aloof or, you know, must have just thought, oh, master doesn't need any of this. But in his interactions, again and again, Yoganandaji was grounding him. And while thinking of that, I thought of a story master shared about Krishna. And he said once Krishna was having a headache. And again, we would not think of Krishna suffering from a headache, especially Master said it was a splitting headache and he was in agony. <laughs> but here it was, it happened, Master said it. <laughs> so Krishna was rolling on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Picture that. <laughs> and the gopis were watching helplessly. And they must have right away asked him, because Master said, they asked, so what can we do? How can we take away this headache of yours? And he said, oh, if even one of you would put your foot on my forehead, this would instantly stop. And they looked at each other and they said, you know, hoping that somebody would do it, but not me. <laughs> I'm not going to put my foot on the head of the Lord of this universe. Master said that even to sit with your feet in the direction of your Guru, even by mistake to touch them in India is considered, you know, as a mistake, we apologize immediately. And he says to put your foot on Krishna's forehead. So they were waiting. It was a wait and watch and he kept rolling. And suddenly Radha ran into the room. She says, where is Krishna? And she saw him, Lord, what happened? And he says, this headache has split my brain. If only one of you would put your foot on my forehead and stop it. And she, is that all? And she put her foot. <gasps> and all the gopis thought, this is it. She's going to go to hell for eternity. What are you doing? What have you done? They asked her and she looked at them. She said, is that all? Eternal damnation? But she says, why would I not do that again and again, even to relieve my Lord for a moment of pain, from a moment of pain? And then Krishna sat up. They all understood what was happening over there. Master, when he was relating this story, also told the monks in a joking way. <laughs> you might see this was his human aspect. And he says, and here I am, born in the middle of three world wars, <laughs> not having a moment of peace, having to travel across the world alone in a ship, carry out these teachings, introduce millions of people to God. And in America, of course, you remember his words. He said, I have to pay these bills. I have to, you know, coax people to meditate again and again and, you know, make them understand these teachings. And then Swami says, I wondered that he's not complaining in his human nature. What's happening over here? And Swami then understood. He says, he was telling me that this is going to be your destiny too. That you all, he says, like Jayaji was saying, God created this out of love. In the end, when we find him, it seems we realize the scriptures say that this was all a dream. It actually didn't even happen because space and time, Krishna declares in the Gita, are illusions that he has created. So when we find him, we realize we were always with him, but he was dreaming, living through us. So Swami says, then I thought about it because Swamiji wanted to be a hermit. And he says that listening to that story, that way Master was addressing in the last few years of his life, what a difficult life particularly this one was. He says, made me affirm that day that I will do whatever it takes I will do that because remember in the big scheme of things even a cycle of 24,000 years is nothing Krishna says he comes again and again and master's trillion of incarnations simply throws us out of the need to even calculate those things but if here we are finding ourselves in this incarnation finding ourselves as JG said in a world where it seems it is falling apart
Let's always remember from an example that I am sure has happened in our own lives where Krishna, you might say, or God or an avatar, any saint in a different form has helped us. You know, I was once in Delhi before I came on the spiritual path. I had started on this particular path. I had started reading different books. And uh, one day I had a need. I had to reach South Delhi from North and it was a very important meeting. And I just thought as a test, I don't look for these miracles too often, but as a test, I said, I prayed to another saint out of this line of gurus. And I said, let's see if he helps me readily. <laughs> Very childish thing on your motorcycle, you want to pass time and reach somewhere fast. And believe it or not, very miraculously I reached there in my heart, I also felt that, oh, there was an intervention and, you know, I was happy. But another time when I was seeking a job in, in the hospital in Delhi, and at that time, I've told this story many times, but I want to, you know, renew it because it is very directly related to Krishna and it is related to this book. And uh, I read in the night in this book, one of the verses where Krishna says to Arjuna, again, a reminder, he says, as long as you think, Krishna, Arjuna, that you can do everything, I will watch. But the day you invite me, into your life. He says, I will come in and take complete charge of it. Now, I didn't even move to the commentary. That word complete just stuck in my mind. You might say I was a bit too logical minded. And I said, complete charge? How is that possible? But there was sincerity in those words. So I, it was 10.30 in the night. I thought, wow, that would be wonderful if Krishna could take complete charge of our lives. And I prayed. I said, I don't know how to call you right now, but please take complete charge of my life. I should add, a few days ago when I had read, I was reading the Gita and Krishna again and again exhorts for the same thing. I was not ready to give complete charge of my life over. I thought about it and I said, no, God knows what he will do. And, you know, so I said, maybe I should still, you know, keep some influence uh, in my hands but few hours later I felt so sorry this was in the middle of the night that thought came to me not to allow God to enter to our life so that was a reminder again and I said this time whichever way you feel uh, I want to be tested and please help me understand the truth behind these words and next day you know I had a very important event of my life I was going to go for the interview for my residency surgical residency I was already three months late so there was a lot of grace invited just to invite me for the interview as I was going well before time and such I heard it's a long story I'll make it very short I heard a beggar blind beggar call out from behind a wall if there's somebody in the vicinity and I looked over the wall this man was had had a rash he was very thin his throat was dry and in short he had traveled a great distance from a di another state to meet the president of the country when I asked him what are you doing here he said I want to meet the president APJ Abdul Kalam I said how? And he pulled out a picture from his pocket and he says, I have known him in the past. He has felicitated me, or given me blankets and such. He told me, if you need anything, come to me. And he came, blind man, across two states by train. He came to meet the president. It so happened that was Ram Nomi, the final day. So the president's office was closed. Anyway, I looked at my watch and I said, I cannot reach, you know, I should either leave him where he is or you know, go with him. And the thought came to me at that time, that verse rung in my mind. If you can invite me, I'll take a complete charge of your life. I was very happy instantly. And I inwardly said, I said, you take care of my interview. I'm going with this man. And I spent six, seven hours with him. We could not meet the president or any other thing. But in the end, when I left him back at the railway station, this was 4.30 p.m. And I said, just out of my respect to apologize with the professor who must be waiting all day for me. I said I should go to the hospital which closes at 5 and apologize. So I went there, his secretary was there and she said he's gone outside the office, please wait, please wait outside. So I kept sitting and I was thinking, you know, what will I say? He'll feel so bad. And uh, before I could think, I saw him walk down and uh, he was very senior. He was the professor of the director of the hospital, very elderly person. And when he came, I got up and I said, I said, good evening, sir. Good evening. He says, good evening. I said, I'm Dr. Aditya. You had invited me for an interview today, this morning at nine o'clock. He said, oh my goodness, you've been waiting all day. <laughs> uh, I couldn't understand. I said, he says, 
I'm sorry, I had some work. I couldn't come to the hospital today. I just came. Uh, I said, oh, it's okay, it's all right. <laughs> and he said, oh, you know, my phone also died because I could not charge it. Can I have your mobile? I said, sure. He took my mobile and he called people. And on the phone he says, I just interviewed this wonderful young man for the post. And I think he's ideal. He had not even seen my papers, whether I've passed out of college. <laughs> and he says, so I'm giving him those papers. Uh, and he can join, could he join from tomorrow? And the person must have said, yes, send him to my office. I went to another person's office across Delhi and this person had thrown me out thrice. You know, I had not for, gone through, I was late basically, very late. So as I was going in his car, he, you know, was going out and he stopped the car and he says, are you Dr. Aditya? I said, yes. He says, please join from tomorrow. I said, so what about my joining letter? He said, oh, don't worry about that. We'll send it. So many of these People, how did they change? I was thinking that day, I mean, while even as I was coming back home, that there is a power, like Jayaji was saying, which first of all pervades the universe, is there for everybody, but is there for that Arjuna in us. Arjuna is the universal deity. Krishna can be formalized as God, as one statue, as a picture. Actually, in this incarnation, Yogananda Ji said he has taken the form of Mahavatar Babaji, our, in our line of gurus. And they take these different forms. They are there. Their presence itself should be a consolation for all of us to aspire to that highest reality. Swamiji says, often, this is a notion, he says, uh, an error in the spiritual path which is common in both West and East, he says we put the saints so high on the pedestal that we forget that their greatness was first of all in the first place to inspire us to become like them and not to keep praising them. Like Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, Lord and do not the things which I say, he told his disciples. Likewise, Swami says in India, people think Krishna was perfect. He says he was in this life. And uh, he says because he was an avatar, but he says his compassion stems from the fact that Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, Shankaracharya, Ramanuja, all of them in their own time, whenever Swamiji says that was, had to climb the same ladder which you and I are climbing today the evolutionary ladder of spirituality. He says their compassion, their understanding, universal benevolence stems from the fact that they know those errors you and I have committed. They will not participate with it. Jayaji says, Duryodhana is wrong. That should be made clear. It's God's job, the Guru's job to put it, put things in perspective. But for us who are seeking, and especially I'll go back to that story where Master said, why was I born in between these world wars? Let us remember, we are practicing the spirituality inside of us, the essence of the Gita is inside of us, but let us always keep that eye open, that intuition open, lest God try to use us as a channel for much greater things which we may dismiss, you know, in our feeling that we are not up to it. So remember, if the Guru is great, so should be his disciples. And a disciple becomes great not by affirming his ego, but by understanding, by actually getting out of the way. How I simply got out of the way, I didn't even go to the interview. <laughs> I just said, I'm going to test what Krishna is saying. So let's, and you know, likewise, I would say my message for that story was, let's see how we can use that verse and day after day, in the very morning especially, invite him, come, come and work through me. I am tired of thinking the same way over these 30, 40, 60, 80 years. Come and think afresh, think anew, speak anew. Kriyananda Ji said Yogananda's voice was never the same. He said if you spoke to him twice on the phone on the same day, his tone was different. His facial expressions were different because he was speaking to a different person. When we are in ever new joy, actually look at the pictures of Swami Kriyananda Ji. Later you can pick up that book. At the last page, there are 40, 50 photos of him. They look the pictures of like five different people. Because when we are going through life, when we are in joy, ever new joy, Swami says that ever new joy inside pours out in the form of new creativity, new writing, new ways of thinking, new ways of embracing and reaching out. And I think we've kind of inherited that in our DNA from Swamiji and Master. So many blessings on this Janmashtami. I pray that uh, Lord Krishna, through our daily meditation, service, devotion, introspection, take birth inside us and uh, express himself in ever new ways in our lives. I would like to invite Jayaji now to please do the Arati. And following that, we will have a flower ceremony. 
we will come one by one we can come in two streams and uh, take a flower offer them in front of the pictures and also those of us our friends who are online you may join us in arati and uh, feel these blessings coming into your lives right where you are